um, and they're in some, some tough times. As far as those that have grown and never stopped growing, there's only 13 other, or I'm sorry, 16 others, and they're all the big ones you might expect, Mecklenburg, uh, Wake, and the big guys. Um, so just by our total population, um, and if you're looking at planning ahead, I can pretty much guarantee you the population will grow up next year and the population will grow up the following four or five years. And, and the pace, we're going to look at the pace here. There's the ad, annual uh, average population growth rate. And I'm going to use my pen here to see if this works out. And if you look at the last seven years, it did work out, we are growing faster than the state or the nation. Um, and that's significant because we have only done that once before, and it was only for three years back in the early 90s. So this is rare territory, um, growing faster than the state or the nation. Um, and there again, I don't see that changing. The state, you can see, it's coming up a little bit, but it's a little bit low. And nationwide, you can see that black line declining, um, which is why there's so much talk about uh, it, um, migration lately, because this country increasingly will be dependent upon that migration. But right now, that's not a concern for us. You probably know this as well, but that uh, big bar there on the left, that this is looking at population growth over 10, 2010 to 2016. And you can see it's almost all uh, domestic in migration. The red is a foreign in migration, and the tiny one, which is much larger in most communities, is natural, which is births over deaths. That the storyline, which I think I'm going to change here, you'll see, was we were attracting baby boomers who obviously weren't having kids, and so our population was aging. Um, this 90, 90 plus percent of our population from domestic immigration has been this way for at least the last uh, 15, maybe 20 years. So this is what we are. We're always about attracting new folks in. But that little natural um, has gotten smaller, but I think when you see, when I look at some of the age groups that are moving into the area, we might see that changing. Um, when I do the, the metro area, the four county metro area, Haywood, Henderson, and Madison have negative for the natural. So this is, this is the only place in the four county metro where we're actually adding people births over deaths, which is a little bit unique. But again, it's very, there's only 11% of counties in the nation in which uh, domestic migration is the last leader. And I'll try to uh, explain this for you, but um, so who are we attracting? The blue bars are uh, by age, the percentage of our current residents, Buckham County residents. The orange bars are who we are attracting. This is over a period, by the way, I forgot to put on. I think this is 2011 through 2016. So any bar, such as this one right here, in which we're attracting 28% of the folks coming in are between the ages of 20 and 29, whereas our population is only 13% of that age group, meaning that group is growing significantly. Um, other groups, um, not so much. Um, when I look at the baby boomers here, you know, you can see that uh, we're still attracting about 20% of the new folks. It's a, it's 11% and 9%, you probably can't see there, are baby boomers, um, which is still not a, as much as a proportion of our existing, uh, but we are still attracting that group. Now, to make a little more sense out of this, here's compared to the nation, I looked at all the new residents, domestic, people that had moved into a new county, um, what their age groups were. And so you can see millennials, this is happening all over the nation. Um, it, but what I thought was interesting as well was the baby boomers down here, we're still picking up um, more than nationwide statistically, uh, which about 20% versus what's the nation there, five and about 13%. We're still picking up baby boomers, is the long story short. That's a, it's a complex chart, I hope that gets across. But uh, the big story here is the millennials are, are coming and they're making up about 28% of the new residents. So that group is gonna, be increasing over time. So if the millennials are increasing nationwide, this may be all really simplistic, where are they leaving? Do you know what I'm saying? If it's where are they coming from? Yeah. Well, um, that age group just moves a lot anyway. Okay. And there's a lot of them. Okay. So when you think of yourselves, when you were 20 to 29, I'm sure a lot of us probably moved. Uh, 
um, because that yeah. is the age. So that, that group is always going to be a big mover, but there's a lot of them. Okay. In fact, it looks like they'll probably be more than the baby boomers. Okay. Which, so, uh, and the importance, I think, for Buncom is that we're attracting them. Other places are not so much. I looked at Henderson County, which is, I look at Henderson sometimes as maybe they're five or 10 years behind where we were. They're still picking up the, the baby boomers, the majority of baby boomers. I think they're, they're uh, 2029 is like down to the 20% of their new residents. But to answer uh, Alan's question further, do you have any idea where they're coming from? I mean, an idea of Midwest, West? Um, I could look it up. Um, you can split this up. I had one slide, it's so it's, you can say how many are from within North Carolina and how many are outside. It's about a 50-50 from within the state and outside the state. Mm -hmm. A little bit helpful. There's a, quite a bit of cross county, you know, people from Haywood moving here, people from Mississippi, people back and forth. But um, if, if uh, Rachel, if you can maybe take a note for me, and I'll try to circle back and, and give her the data. That's a good question though. Do you have that by ethnicity, what they are? I think so. Yeah. I think so. That's a good question. So I see we're already on the employment journey. I could spend a half an hour on just that. Um, here's it, total employment. Again, this is one of those charts that sort of speaks for itself. The uh, Citizen <coughs> Times called me last week and they said, boy, we're really trying to write an article about um, if we've made it out of the recession yet, and I said, I got a couple slides for you to see, because back in 2013, um, we already had, a, a, we'd already replaced all the, the jobs in Bunker County that were lost. So, um, no problems here. Um, ever since 2013, we've been, we've peaked past where we were at in 2008, which our previous peak was, you probably all know this, let me just break it down here. Here's net annual employment change. This is the increase in employment, just the net. You can see that for the last eight years, we've been adding folks. 2015, for whatever reason, was a big year, and we're gonna see that through a few other slides. And you're also seeing there's a, a bit of a decline. So although we're growing uh, pretty strong, that pace of growth for employment um, has come down a bit. Here it is, it's a percentage relative to the state and the nation. And there again, you can see that pretty much we're following what's happening by the state and the nation, except for these two years here, where we really had a burst uh, of, of employment. But you can also see that the, the trend is, is down to slower than we were. I should have said in the previous slide, our, um, and I'll backtrack a little bit, um, we're looking at percentages here. For population, our annual growth rate over the last 47 years is 1.2%. And as you may recall, that slide of population growth were at 1.3%. And so I run into a lot of people and they're downtown and they say, all oh, this building boy, we're just booming population, just flowing in. We're really not uh, population wise. We're right about where we're, you know, 1.3 and 1.2 is right about the same spot that we've been over the last 40 years. We've only hit 2% a few times in the 90s, and we haven't gotten anywhere close to that. So as far as population, we're not necessarily booming on population. Um, obviously, employment goes up and down because we have a bit of community to talk about that. But that's well, just the, um, and you, you might have, you have some, but the tourist visitor population has grown much oh, faster, absolutely. right? So the, yeah. like the number of people walking around the streets, it has jumped, but not all those people live here all the time. Yeah. 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 And I don't have the latest numbers on that. Actually, if you can write that down, that, that's something the city loves. It's the number of daytime versus night, uh, daytime versus resident population and the influx of people. So this is the one I want to spend a few minutes on. This is just the net growth, 2012 since 2017 in jobs. And uh, Randy gets to what you're talking about, um, tourism. So as you can see, it's healthcare and tourism. Uh, that's really the major drivers. The top three here, I consider retail, by the way, a part of, closely part of tourism as well. If you look at our per capita spending in uh, retail, um, it's about 30% more here, meaning there's, we, per capita we spend about 30% more. 
on retail, a meaning that's probably outsiders that are spending that with them. It's not residents. Um, the top, these are all industries in which grew, except for the bottom, which we'll talk about in the middle, minute here. Um, they added more than a thousand net new jobs um, since 2012. There's quite a few industries that you don't show. Um, real estate, uh, financial services, trucking, warehousing. That's because they're all right here. They've never, they haven't done much. Um, these are the big guys. These are the ones that are driving our economy, which makes it kind of simple for us um, because there's only a few there. The, the top three account for 54% of all net new jobs. So healthcare, restaurants, accommodations, and retail trade, that's over half of all net new jobs. These seven right here um, account for 85% of all net new jobs. So it's, it's a fairly simple economy in that respect. Some communities I'm at, and they've got you know a dozen or more that are growing at once, but ours are relatively simple. Now, um, if you look at, you're probably just as interested in what's happened over the last year. And so the last year, it's a little bit different because we've seen a decline in administrative services, which are temps, um, and what, um, this is anecdotal. Um, they're telling me that a lot of those temps are becoming permanent because of the tight labor market, um, which makes sense. And uh, interestingly enough, if you look at manufacturing, um, it almost mirrors the two. So it might, a lot, might be a lot of temps in manufacturing that are becoming permanent. Is there, um, about on the temps and the employee versus manufacturers? Yeah, there is. There's okay. quite a bit. And, and when you look at the number of small businesses, we're a small business. Right. Here. I mean, that's where the majority, but all you need is a couple of large ones, and it, and it sort of takes up the difference. So, you know, when you look at actually where people work, they're just as likely to work as a, as big as a small, but the number of small is huge and growing. That makes sense. Right. Okay. Yeah. Also, a little sidebar here, um, the, the manufacturing that I sort of buried, um, I looked at the metro level manufacturing, the four counties, uh, end of last year, which was only a few months ago. About 44%, here's an interesting fact, of manufacturing job growth was in beverages, beverage uh, breweries. So again, uh, tourism. Even though it's manufacturing, it's closely related to tourism. So <coughs> tourism uh, has a huge impact. And Tom, is that that growth in manufacturing <coughs> over the last few years? I mean, it looks like it was flat for years, and now it's it positive. I mean, I think there's just a general sense that you know that that's like around the state, around the country, that's kind of a even or negative. So, so how unusual is is the fact that we've had several years of it is some growth uh, in manufacturing? I just looked at that this morning. I'll get the numbers. After Rachel's gonna be busy writing this down. Um, we grew significantly more here than the state or the nation as far as manufacturing. And I don't remember, I, I apologize, I don't remember the numbers, but it was a big difference. So that's interesting that beverages are included in that. So, uh, so the beer industry beer, also. Beer, wineries, distilleries, yeah. 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 And that's, like I say, that's been almost half of the net increase at the metro. I, I'd have to check and see with the county, but I would imagine. Is there a similar. breakdown of beverage versus other? as far as employees? Oh, the other manufacturing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think transportation equipment was the second. Okay. Big contributor in electronics, but yeah. Good questions, and I wish I had an hour here. Huh. Sorry, you probably wish I don't, didn't. Um, so, <laughs> so the next slide is gonna go right into, so what did this do to wages? Uh, we could spend a, a lot of time on this. Uh, so let me explain what this says. This is a five-year, percent of the total uh, employment gains in Buncombe County by their average industry earnings. And so I looked at the industries up here um, and I broke them all down into their subcategories. So there's 76 industries and I looked at the ones that pay the lowest. They did the lowest quartile, um, which is right here, which would be employees making less than $27,000. The middle, 50% is here and then the top, which is 51,000 or more. Now, the first thing you should know that although we've had growth, growth of 45% of the net new jobs were in these low income or low bottom earning industries, that's actually 32% of all employees. So 32% of the employment base 
but the growth that's been 45% of the net new job. So there's going to be more of those low wage earners. If you look at the, the group down here, that's 45% of the existing, 34% of the new. And then up here, 23%. So 23%, hope this makes sense, of existing workforce, but it, it only grew by 21%. See some crowns. Does that make sense? So the, the point is, this is where the growth is. This is where things are, have been happening over the last five years. Um, and this is where it's not happening. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of the industries here in a minute. So the risk, then, is, is the thing about risk is in terms of what that does for support services. Yeah, so there's going to be more people I mean, if this continues. Or right now, there is more, relatively more growth in low wage, so there'll be more low wage households, I would suspect. Is that kind of what you're thinking? And, and that's kind of a no brainer, really. And, and that's 27,000 or less. No, no, this is everybody here. I'm okay, sorry. This okay. is the whole ball of life. Okay. Okay. And here's here's what we're talking about, just so you know. I picked the top three growth industries for each one of these. And so bottom earning industries, surprise, surprise, restaurants, um, which I think it's about three thousand jobs, um, food and beverage stores, grocery stores, it's about nine thousand or nine hundred and sixty, and then clothing and accessory stores, that was eight hundred. So retail and tourism for those jobs. For um, the middle group here, middle earnings, <coughs> hospitals, the big one, uh, about 1,500 administrative services, which I've already told you that's pretty in decline. That was 1,500 jobs. And then what's called specialty trade contractors, which would be roofers, um, site for preparation, masonry, even I think plumbing is in there, sort of your average contract job. That's where the growth for the uh, middle earning industries. And then the top is back to healthcare, ambulatory healthcare services, doctors, dentists, labs, um, oh, you know, chiropractors, any that kind of service. So you can see on the middle and high you've got healthcare um, by the dominant with the dominant growth. It gets back to my slide before. Uh, professional, scientific, and technical services, just FYI, that is uh, consultants, engineers, architects, um, which actually over the last year we've seen a bit of a decline in that group. That's always been when I was the chamber, that was always where the gold was. We're going to attract these professional, scientific, and technical services industries, but it just hasn't panned out um, to the degree that a lot of people expected. And investment services, I think you probably recognize what that would be. So here is probably a slide that you've all seen before, but it's probably worth sharing, and that's just compared um, average monthly earnings to the state, um, the nation, and Bunker County. We're about 20% below, and it's really hard to tease out a trend um, as far as are we narrowing that gap. The best I could do is about a third of a percent point gain per year. So there is a bit of a gain, but uh, you know, if you took a third of a point, we're about 20% different. That, that means it'd be over 100 years before we gained, and I'm sure they're not going to sit and wait for us to gain. So that's sort of a hard pill to swallow, but it, it is part of who we are, and it doesn't change um, that dramatically from year to year. And then digging down uh, into that, as far as this is all work, by the way, folks that are uh, actively working, this is by race and ethnicity. And um, you can see that it's somewhat shocking here. Um, black workers are making about a third less, um, about 8% of the workforce. Hispanic, about a, a quarter less. They're about 5% of the workforce. And uh, shockingly, um, the, the black uh, workforce is actually spreading a little bit apart. So they're, they're not catching up. I have another slide that shows that uh, Hispanics have. Hispanic employment, um, uh, sort of stereotypical, um, are in uh, overwhelmingly in healthcare and construction. And so um, they have benefited um, more recently from the recent growth as far as their earnings. But it's only a, a portion of a percentage. Um, I put in Asian just because it's so unusual, although in our workforce, there's only 2,000 
Asian workers, um, and in American Indian, there's only 700, which I was surprised how low that number was. There it is by gender. Um, it's about 27, 30% difference here. Um, and this is, this is narrowing. It's, it's moving up about a quarter to a half percent a year. Um, and I know I've drilled into these. Um, female uh, employment is uh, heavily weighted towards healthcare and education, and um, male is heavily to uh, manufacturing and construction, um, and most of the other industries. Do you yeah. have one for black women? No. I mean, I, I don't know if I can. I'll have to look at my notes. You can, you can, sometimes you can't do two, you can do black or you can do women, but you might not be able to do black. Gotcha. Do we have data, a drill down data available to compare salaries within the same sector by gender? So we can see men in healthcare, women in oh, yeah, manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that available? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I do recall um, that um, female workers uh, are paid less in every single industry sector. 82 cents to the dollar typically, but I wonder locally. <laughs> no, that was, that was local numbers. <clears throat> OK. Yeah. But I'll, I'll get the data. The data is available. And then I looked at the last, over the last five year, average annual change in monthly earnings. And um, this is the nation of the state, which is 2.3. So you can see there has been some growth. Um, not a tremendous amount, but we're keeping up. We're not falling behind, um, except for these two groups, which in fact are falling behind. By the way, this is not an adjusted for inflation. I looked that up, and so inflation is 1.3. So inflation is like right there. So there's nobody's making a huge uh, bunch of money anywhere, in nation, state, or locally. Um, but at least uh, there are some, some positive movements, although they're only a slight few percentages. So let's go into commuting. We're doing good on time here. I know that's been an issue, um, and it's unique in this area for several reasons. <laughs> so you can see that uh, living and working um, is coming up. That's what, one thing I want to point out. That was, this is only 2015, by the way. That's yeah. the most uh, it's a little frustrating. Uh, in 2013, um, this was a peak right here where we had 42% uh, of workers in Buncombe County were driving in. Now, when I was giving talks and looking at this, I would say, you know, in a few years, it's going to be over half the people working in the county are going to be, outs are going to be uh, outsiders. But you can see the interesting thing is this has changed. So the working and living in Buncombe County, that actually over the most current year, that increased by 5,000. So, that's a fascinating question, you know, why that is. Those people were driving from outside and now they're living here. Um, so something's changed and we have a few slides we may get to that. And then I think as interesting is um, this group of end commuters. Um, there's fewer of those. There's about uh, 2,000 less of those. So that's a, a real change um, in a trend that's, we've, that's been going on for at least a decade. And, and I think probably a, one that probably most of us would like to see. That being said, we, you see the peak was actually back in 2005 when we actually had the most live and work um, in the county. So we're not quite there, we're almost there yet. But as you know, the county has grown a whole lot from that point. And a little bit of a decline here in our community too, which I'm sure are probably these folks up here. And they're coming from Henderson County. <laughs> from <Indiana. laughs> Um, pretty flat line, everybody else. I live in Haywood County. Hasn't, not a lot has changed there, and McDowell's actually declined a little bit. I, I did a project for the uh, Henderson County Commission probably been three years ago, and their economy um, was at that time, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't. They had not regained their jobs. Like we had regained our jobs here, um, I, I said by 2013. They had not, but if you looked at their community numbers, that's because they were coming here. So they had just, you know, they couldn't find work in Henderson County after the, the loss of jobs there. 
So they, many of them, decided to come to Buncombe County. So that was sort of the relief valve for that county. And then I looked at the net worker inflows by industry, meaning importing workers. And it's virtually every industry. The only one that doesn't show up here is one I didn't talk about earlier, and that was education <coughs> services that I showed on that one slide was declining, and I forgot to mention the declines that I show on that slide probably are not as significant. Um, and I'll just take a little segue to talk about educational services. Educational services is public and private, um, and private um, <coughs> employment and educational services has uh, gone up by about 500 jobs. Um, on the, the public side, it breaks out into local and state, and the state would be, I guess, UNCA, that's up about 100 jobs. But local employment and educational services um, public is down by, still down by about 150 jobs. So that's the only one that really hasn't caught up. Um, I don't know why, there's probably some of you that may understand that better than I do. But that's actually the, the only group, there's 127 people in educational services that drive out of Buncombe County for their jobs which sort of makes sense because that area has actually shrunk a little bit. The rest of these are all up and this is the number that we're importing. So we're, we're importing um, a, good, a good bunch of people and we'll probably continue to. And then there were some questions I know I had heard about, this is a really confusing chart and I'll make sense of it. Travel time, all this uh, in commuting and out commuting, doesn't that mean that people are spending more time on the road? And so I looked at 2011, this is the amount of time, these are minutes over here, that you spend on the road to get to your job. And it, it's hard, it, this jumps out, it looks like a big change right there, but we have changes in the other direction here. So I'm gonna write the, the average median time, um, the average time that people spend on a, in 2011, a Buncombe County resident spent 20.2 minutes driving to work. In 2016, they spent 20.8. So it hasn't changed a whole lot. So if I was doing this in Henderson County, it'd be a big difference. But overall, uh, travel time to work has not changed a whole lot over the most recent five years. And um, FYI, it's still about 76% of workers are driving to work by themselves in a car. And that hasn't changed much either. This is a, we're doing good on, how, on time, by the way. This is kind of a wild one here. Um, there's some stuff here. I, I have never sat down and uh, accumulated all the permit data into one spreadsheet. So I'm going to share that with you. And um, the word shocking might be too strong, but um, some of this data is pretty ex explosive, maybe. Here's retail sales, and you can see, you can see, by the way, these are months, so you can see Christmas. Uh, this is why I tell reporters you never can report what happened in January versus December, because it always drops. Um, and you can obviously see the trend, but I this little small chart down here at the bottom overlaid it is the percentage change on a 12-month moving average. And so um, you can see that retail sales has been uh, still up, up by about 5%. It's declining, though. And if you were to look back at my employment numbers, there's that 2015 where it kind of peaks. Um, so retail sales, although it's larger year over year, the pace of that growth has been declining. Can't say exactly why, but uh, don't think it's just that retail sales are booming and going up and up, up. They're actually sort of moderating. And here's the numbers that really are. This is total permit value. Um, so this would be all the permits in the un unincorporated Buncombe County, and it would also be any new structures within the city that Buncombe County owns. So the new uh, Buncombe County um, Health and Human Services building, that would be in here, and there'd probably be a few others, but nothing too major. And you can see that there's a, a new world we're at here. I'm gonna give you an example here. So the average uh, monthly permit value, now this is, I'll break it down in a few, slides in the future here, but commercial, multifamily, and single family, that's basically um, what's in here, plus you've got some uh, smaller um, groups as well. But the average monthly in between 2010 and 2013 was 15.4, is that 
Right. Millions per month. Good amount of money. So what is it going 2013 to today? It is 36.5 million. So the story is it's double. And remember, a lot of this stuff is uh, on paper. A lot of it is still uh, being worked. You know, it hasn't worked its way out. We're not seeing it all yet. So this, this I can say, we're going to see a lot more or continuing of uh, very strong um, construction activity. And it's double what we were in previous years. You can see this as well in the different categories. Remember, this is a six-month moving, so there's a lot of peaks right here. Uh, that you know you wouldn't you would see if I did month to month, but it's just too busy. Um, and let me give you some examples of the differences here, which again are pretty shocking. So, multifamily. <clears throat> Is this working? I kind of like writing on my screen. <laughs> I don't have to remember a lot of these numbers. <laughs> um, was like monthly was about eight hundred thousand um, before two thousand fourteen. Uh, multifamily now is um, 1.7 million average per month. So getting near triple uh, for Just that the number. permit value? I'm sorry? The permit value was yeah, the permit value. Yeah. So it'd be the value of the building. You know? Val value of the building. Okay. And I have a following slide we'll get into units actually. And then single family was um, about 8.2. Oh. 8.2 here million, sorry, left-handed. Um, but right now, we're looking at uh, 19.6 million. So again, more than double. And then finally, commercial, which uh, you can really see has boom. Commercial, the average commercial um, previous was 4.7 million per month in Buncombe County. So that was uh, 4.7 million, and now commercial is 11.8 million per month. That's a huge jump there. So sorry for my scratches. Hopefully, it made sense. But everything has doubled or more per month on average. This is a six-month moving average, which spreads it out. But if you were to put month per month, it would just it explodes out that way. Is that reflective of the quality, is, or is it the cost of materials, or can it be both? Or? Uh, yes, yes. I, I don't know. Really, to be quite honest, it's probably a combination of all. Oh, we're looking at what what we constructed. You look at IB Tech and their plan we constructed in that area, up in that you know the upper group. But we we constructed a lot of new buildings in life in, in that period. Before. I won't draw on this slide much, but uh, <coughs> commercial is, there's two pieces of commercial, which actually sort of mean two different things. New is what you would think it is, it's new. And the commercial additions and alterations are working on what's, what's already there. Um, and I have, the reason I show this, I've been to some communities that have a lot of commercial and it's all new, um, and some that it's just the other way around. But you can see, at least most recently, there's a lot of uh, additions and alterations of existing that's, that's online because I know that property values are hard, and so people end up buying and redoing what they already have. Now here's the units, I think this is what you're talking about. This is quarterly units, um, and again, the big picture here is a huge number of multifamily units. Over the last two years, I counted up the number of single family and the number of multifamily, and they were almost identical, about 1,700 new units in each group. And looking back, we've never had anything um, for that, you know, we had a quarter maybe, but never two years of that. So a real surge in multifamily, uh, I would suspect probably the biggest surge ever. And I can go back a few years here and don't, don't pick up anything like that. Here's monthly uh, foreclosures still in the housing um, side of things. These are down to the teens, by the way, in the months. This would be a reflection of the stress on houses. Um, and so this would say people are buying homes, but they're able to buy homes and they can afford to buy homes. I have this data going back to 1998. This is the lowest it's ever been. Uh, some, of the, some of the months in the past, I think I wrote this down, uh, 
for years. Uh, so right now we're on, we're on pace to have about 250 foreclosures for the year of 2017. In the uh, previous bubble years, we were up to about 1,200 per year. So a huge change there. In spite of all the new building and the new household uh, residential activity going on, there's not a lot of uh, pain, at least at the foreclosure level. And so if someone says, are we getting ready for a bubble? Um, there's no sign of a bubble here at all. In fact, this looks very healthy. Here's existing home sales. The red line is the average price, which obviously you can see it, it's going up. And then the bars are the quarterly number of homes to sell. And this chart just sets us up for the next chart. So what I did is I looked at year over year change uh, by quarter. And so what this says is prices are going up. Um, almost double digit, but the number of homes is going down. Um, I just so happened, I picked up my mail and my PO box on the way here, and Beverly Hanks has a quarterly um, real estate report, and they show one to two months of inventory for homes $400,000 or less in Washington County. So an incredibly tight market. I, I don't know if we've ever been this tight before. And those are some, you know, those are pretty healthy prices there, you know, imagine getting 13% more. This is my uh, shot at big data. I just went to <laughs> Zillow. Zillow is great in that they give away their data. Um, some of the other organizations don't do that. And what they, this is the 60 counties in North Carolina in which they've collected enough data to have <clears throat> monthly home sales. And you can see, um, this is sort of what I would say would be the pack. Um, and these are the high flyers. And as you can see, Buncombe County is, uh, whether it wants to be or not, is in a high flyer. So I think that's Dare County, Orange County, and Chatham are above us. You can't see it, um, but Wake County is right behind us there. But a, a real, and I don't think you can find any other line on there, those other counties, that shows this sort of movement. Um, we've gone from, eighth in the state to fifth in the state as far as the median home value. So pretty dramatic jump there. And then those of you that are interested in rent, um, this is 81 counties and it's the same sort of picture. We went from the 12th highest to the sixth highest. And again, I think you've got Chatham at the top, Orange and Wake. So you've got communities out in the Outer Bank and the communities that are you know, within Raleigh Durham areas that are very high, relatively high earnings counties. This is a federally produced number, same home appreciation whenever Fannie Mae or Fannie Mac re, uh, revalues a house because either it's sold or somebody's getting a new mortgage on it. They look at the value of that home. And uh, so you can see that over the last uh, three years, we've been, homes have been appreciating here greater than in the state or the nation, um, although it's still like eight or 9%. We, in the past, we got all the way up to 13% annual appreciation rates um, before the big bubble. But we had uh, four years of negative. You might not have known that, but we had four years of home value, declining home value, which we're way past that right now. And this is a, this is third party. This is the National Home Association of Home Builders. So I can't, I don't know how they came up with this number. It's, it's supposed to be, they look at household income and they say what they would estimate uh, the number of folks that could afford a home. And um, so the point of this slide is you can see affordability is declining. Um, I think we're at 58% of home, um, home owners or home households are able to afford a home. Um, which has been declining for since 2013, which is probably no surprise. And then the last few slides, we're doing really good on time, by the way, a little bit of a puzzle, but I think you should probably see it, especially because I know you're all interested in home affordability. Um, this is households with housing costs that are greater than 30% of your household income. These are, um, HUD calls these homes that are housing burdened, meaning that they can barely afford to live where they're at. And um, huge drop, it's, I think it's about 4,000 or more households, uh, renter households, um, be dropped off the affordability being um, 
house for cost burden. Now, I look at these numbers all the time, and the first thing that I think of is somebody got it wrong. So I looked at this data, and it had a margin of error, 90% um, uh, plus or minus 1,000. So even if you went 1,000, it's either here, you know, somewhere down here or somewhere up here. Um, it's still a big change. There's been something significant that happened here. Now, I look back at the multi family permitting and think maybe we're seeing that, you know, maybe this is the first signs of actually, and less people driving outside and staying here. So that might be the first signs of, of what all this building is actually doing, which is obviously, do you understand this slide before I go to the next one? I see you. Could, so, yeah, could you walk through, could you narrate it one more time? Sorry, yeah, so this is the, the number of, of, and I got, these are renters and owners that spend more than 30% of their income on housing. Right, so you see Which them. is meaning uh, unaffordable, you know, their housing is, their stress. And um, <coughs> it's dropped, between 2015 and 2016, right. it dropped, I think, by about 4,000 homes, which is pretty significant. But, right. but, but, oh, but some of that has to do with basically, well, not right there, but the way the property tax, the value of the property tax has gone up, especially in areas like West Nashville and stuff, that the, the people who are renting the property are having to charge more to cover the <coughs> property taxes. Yeah, but wouldn't that mean there's still their cost would go up, the renters' cost would go up? Yeah, I don't the renters' cost would have to go up, that's why it's falling. They can't afford to rent. Oh, no. yeah, well, I mean, so there's all sorts of hypotheticals. You could say they moved out of the area, you know, they're driving in from Henderson because they couldn't afford it. It could be a, could be a negative. I'd like to think that because of this unusual amount of construction, that you know maybe we're seeing some of that too. You know that they're able to have more affordable housing, but it's it's hypothetical. I don't know. I did check and see. So how does this compare to the state and the nation? And you know the number of uh, owner occupied percentage-wise is pretty much like it is nationwide. A little bit lower as far as rent, but but not a, a big difference. And then I went one step further and looked at by. Um, Income, and so this is all about those who are earning less than uh, households earning less than twenty thousand. Doesn't really answer the question, but that's where the real movement has been, and a movement for the positive, we think, unless they're not living here. But we don't have any indication that they packed up and moved. So less homes, um, cost burden, at the lowest group. Can't, can't answer specifically. I, I would say that it might have something to do with um, the multifamily building. So we're doing so good on time. Here's my summary, and then, I, I, you know, any time we have here, we can uh, have a few more minutes. Uh, the strong and solid population growth continues. That's, you know, that you can put in the bank. That's, you know, you're very fortunate in that respect. Outpacing the state and the nation for the last seven years. Domestic in-migration, you know, it's always about people moving into the area. That's the history of Buncombe County in Western North Carolina is uh, our population growth is 90% or more because of people moving in. And fortunately in Buncombe County, we're seeing about 28% of those people are millennials. So I, I know my years at the chamber, there was always a concern that what's going to happen when the baby boomers run out. Um, and they are running out and we're still attracting them but we've replaced them, more than replaced them, with millennials. Um, and that's not, that's not, uh, has not been experienced in the surrounding counties, by the way. So I live in Haywood. I wouldn't have this conversation in Haywood because they're, they're older and they're attracting more older folks. Still. We've had eight years of job growth, but it has been declining or slowing down in the last few years, still positive. Um, healthcare and tourism by far dominate job growth. Um, and unfortunately, low earnings jobs also, 45% uh, percent of the net new jobs were in low uh, earning industries. And the gaps in minority and gender earnings are persistent, and there's not a lot of movement at the aggregate level. And we are seeing earnings gains, fortunately, which are greater than the state and the nation. Uh, in commuter is playing a strong role, but it it's, looks like there's a trend where that may have turned around a little bit. That, that's something that caught my eye. Henderson, major source, um, and Buncombe County, outside of uh, a couple hundred people that drive out for education, educational services, um, it's importing workers for all the other sectors. 
permitting, uh, permitting activity um, surges. I almost used the word boom, but I'm always afraid to use that word, but it's across everything. Everything's double or more uh, previous to 2013. Um, the housing market is incredibly tight. Um, as I said, what I read this morning, one to two months of inventory for anything below $400,000 and prices and rents, as my big data slide show, keep climbing uh, not only to ourselves but relative to the rest of the state. And the affordability signals are mixed. Um, we've got a lot of building. We've got obviously the census numbers showing that there's a reduction in the number of uh, people that are, are uh, cost burdened. But there's some other data that doesn't fit that as well. So, thank you. And I'd love for any other questions, does, comments. Does your data show that, um, or maybe you don't want to answer this, but then I'm going to ask it later. Yep. Does your data show, or has it been proven, that indeed short term rentals interfere with affordable housing? I don't have any data that actually, it's interesting questions, but I don't. Do you, do you have do you have data on the amount of short-term rentals in the community? Um, I would just have to go to, is, is, uh, I think the city keep track of that? Does the county keep track of that as well? I, I, I don't so think there's, no, um, there's no federal or state agency. There's no permit, there's no permit required in the county, right? So we wouldn't track it because people aren't required to tell us, right? No. Now, I know I've done some work on hotel motel sales, which is that is now a part of that. Um, and so that they do have published data. I know it's a huge number. Of, uh, anything, and I know your time is precious. I don't want to waste it. Was there anything that jumped out? The, the permitting really surprised me, actually. I didn't realize it was so. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bad trends on the economic side, for sure. Um, the the housing affordability stuff that that's really interesting and kind of encouraging. I mean, it seems like like all these new apartments that are being built and coming online. I mean, it seems like intuitively that's got to be part of it. Is like there's there's got to be some competition there where they're having to kind of get tenants in and they're offering a little bit better. Uh, deals, but it'd be interesting to see if there's a way that can be fleshed out. Um, I mean, I know there's a lot of concern around this kind of incredible growth of the apartment developments, just from a kind of a, a land use and growth management standpoint. But, but if it is helping in that way, I mean, that's I mean that's kind of been the hope is that that what? you know that bringing all these additional units online will help the market meet that need in a little bit more affordable way. So as as that trend continues, if, if that can be kind of confirmed that that really is what's going on there, that would be great. Yeah, to I would love to see one more year of data, you know, to yeah. see if I, that confirms. Um, I, I think you had it once before, but the percentage um, that people <clears throat> pay in rent when they're in the 27000 and less of their income, do you remember what that was? From this presentation here? Or, 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 oh, or, no, I don't remember. Um, I know, um, Mandy, remember I did a pretty deep dive yeah. on housing. That's probably what we were thinking of. I, yeah. I can look yeah, at HHS. Yeah. 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 The board meeting. Uh -huh. Yeah, we looked at by race and by age right. and all that a lot. And it wasn't very positive, as I recall. No. But actually, we have another year of data since then, too. It'd be good, good, <coughs> It'd be good well, to go back and. Yeah, I'd like to say it again. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to update it. <laughs> But Mitt Browning's right, maybe with competition with the apartments still. Yeah, maybe that's the, So you're saying that, that that's a possible reason for that, that blue line drop? It's a, it's a guess. I, I don't know what else would be it. And, you know, we know it's not, they're not, it's not, it doesn't look like it's because they're they're moved somewhere else and they're driving in because right. those numbers don't drive either. So that's, that's an idea. You know, I'm always afraid to just throw something out there without really knowing for sure. But something happened. Uh, or is happening with that group. And the, you know, when I look at the other side, supply is increasing on the multifamily side. That would, that would be good to know how many apartments have come online. Yeah, and that's another thing. A permit is a permit, and it doesn't necessarily mean it actually has happened yet. And I don't know, maybe we would know the average time from issuing a permit to actually opening the door, what that turnaround time is. 
Well, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. the great questions. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank Terrific job. Great job. All right, so we've got uh, we've got 15 minutes scheduled for a break. So let's take a break, and we will start back promptly at 1:45. <laughs>